House, where in the next hour, District 5 Democratic candidates for the Montgomery County Council face off. Gymnastics for 18-month-old toddlers? We'll take a look inside the Silver Stars program in Silver Spring. By day, he writes for the Washington Post, but by night, Eric Brace slings on his folk rock guitar. We'll hear the results. Plus, author William Wazo discusses his new memoir, The Shooting of Rabbit Wells. Well, Pat Alterheide looks at the summer silver screen fair and the big business of product tie-ins, and Rose Solari offers up a poem. Hi, and welcome to Coffee House Forum. If you live in Maryland, then you probably know there's an election coming up with a whole host of candidates, Democrats as well as Republicans, who hope to make Paris Glendening a one-term governor and do so by portraying themselves as more trustworthy and more pro-development than the sitting governor. In Montgomery County, there's a county council general election in November and primary races for both at-large and district seats on September 15th. Here again, economic development is a hot issue and it's one that divides the two Democratic candidates for the South County District 5 council seat. They are incumbent Derek Berlage, a lawyer, and challenger Mark Elrich, an elementary school teacher and member of the Tacoma Park City Council. Welcome both of you to the coffee house. Great to be here. Thanks. No Mark, coffee. Um, you're the challenger. True. Uh, there must be some reason you believe that the District 5 uh, constituents could be better served. I guess I think there are, there are a couple of issues. One is um, the, the council's vote on pay and go really concerned me in the fall. I thought that um, Pay and go is. Pay and go is the legislation that suspends the adequate public facilities ordinance for a period of time and as originally conceived basically allowed developers to pay less of the infrastructure cost than they'd even been paying before. And um, I thought at the time when all the other jurisdictions in the metro area were talking about how much growth was costing them and beginning to talk about implementing impact fees that Montgomery County was moving in the exact opposite direction and that where we had once been a beacon of sane growth and planning we were abandoning the adequate public facilities ordinance, which many jurisdictions considered the, the prime example of good planning. Um, so that concerned me. And I think um, reflecting on that and, and the situation of the county with very overcrowded schools and jammed up roads that came out of the last growth spurt, it, it's at least apparent to me that we need to be much more careful in how we manage the, the future of growth in the county to make sure that, um, that we can support the schools and support the roads and provide the kind of community that we want. And we just don't support growth for the good of, or just assume the growth is good in and of itself. And are you saying that Council Member Berlage supports growth for its own end? Well, I, th I thought his, his vote on, um, on Pango was troubling. In, in the Friendship Master Plan, he voted for a level of development that exceeded the uh, Planning Board's recommendation. And then Silver Spring, he was supporting the American Dream, which yeah, I thought was I mean, just incredible. When the American Dream, Mega Mall. The Mega Mall. When you consider that the previous project barely, I mean, they had to re redo the traffic standards to fit in the other project, which was much smaller than the American Dream. And even then, the county said we were going to create the worst conditions in the county. And then to think that the American Dream, more than twice as big, wouldn't create a total disaster in Silver Spring, I thought was, was wrong. How about that? Are you uh, pro-development no matter what? Well, you know, the growth issue that really interests me and that I think interests my constituents in Tacoma Park and the other communities I represent in Silver Spring and Kensington and Wheaton is growth in the county government's support for our communities. And that's what's been my priority for the last eight years. And working with the residents of these communities, we've worked very hard and very successfully to make sure that Montgomery County gives our section of the county its fair share of resources and that we never have to settle again for second best. And that's why we've gotten the funding to modernize more than 400 classrooms in our communities. We've received eight new parks, one for each of the years I've been in office, uh, funding for two new recreation centers, and just recently $138 million to revitalize downtown Silver Spring and $10 million to begin the expansion of Montgomery College from Tacoma Park into South Silver Spring. Now that's the kind of growth that I'm interested in. And when my number one economic priority is and always has been the revitalization of downtown Silver Spring. Uh, we've had a number of different plans. The Mega Mall, everyone I think agrees that 
although it was maybe worth taking a look at, when we looked at it closely, it didn't make sense for our community and the money wasn't there. We have today a terrific plan, a town center plan that is very popular and that will bring downtown Silver Spring back to the glory days that they enjoyed in the past and I'm very proud of what we've done. Isn't that a little bit though of 2020 hindsight, at least on the, the Mega Mall? Uh, you were associated with supporting it at the time it was uh, on the table. Well, what I supported and what I said when that was first unveiled to the public, in fact, it became a very famous quote, was that the uh, proposal by the Gramazian brothers uh, and the county's interest in that proposal represented uh, a courtship, not a marriage. We were looking them over, they were looking us over. And we said, uh, and Doug Duncan and I were very united on this when that project was first introduced to the public, was that we would only support the actual construction of the American Dream Project if two things happened. One, the community of Silver Spring and Tacoma Park had to support it. And secondly, the financing had to be there to build it. And in the end, neither of those conditions were met. Doug Duncan pulled the plug, I pulled the plug, the county council pulled the plug, and we went back to the drawing boards and we came up with a great plan. Sure, I wish that we'd come up with the town center plan five years ago, not two years ago. But five years ago, no one was proposing a town center development. Folger Pratt hadn't submitted the kind of proposal that they later submitted. And when we got that kind of proposal that made sense for our community, we grabbed at it and we got the funding from both the state and the county in record time. And that project is moving forward. We hope to break ground in the spring. What about pay and go? Uh, Mark Elrich says that uh, that's another indication that you are pro-development for its own sake. Uh, there were two votes on pay and go. Uh, uh, why don't you tell me about your votes? Well, there, there were two votes on pay and go. There was the initial creation of the program, and, uh, which I supported, and then there was later a vote to pull out the residential portion of the program and apply it only to commercial. And I supported that pulling back of the pay and go um, mechanism as well. Why? I am, um, first let me, let me talk about growth and let me talk about the environment. Because I have a very strong and a very long record of support for the environment. I'm the sponsor of the county's forest conservation bill, which has already saved more than 2,000 acres of forest. Uh, I'm also no friend of the development industry. You can ask anybody in the development industry, and they will tell you that, for example, a couple years ago, I went down to Annapolis to get state approval for the systems development charge that now requires developers to pay for water and sewer mains so that we, the WSSC ratepayers, don't have to. And because of that initiative that I launched, and anyone will tell you that I was the the one who personally launched it, WSSC ratepayers today save $28 million a year. Developers pay that money instead of ratepayers. But as strong a record as I have on the environment, um, I'm an environmentalist with a brain. And my brain tells me that we need a strong economy in Montgomery County or we're not going to have the tax revenues to pay for good schools and good parks and good libraries. And we are in a period when the federal government is shrinking. Federal job growth in Montgomery County is nothing like what it used to be, and we've got to figure out where our economic future lies, and I believe it lies with the high-tech and biotech industries that will provide quality jobs for our very educated workforce. Those high-tech and biotech companies all said that the growth management process in the county was broken, and if we didn't fix it, they weren't going to stay in Montgomery County, they were going to go to Fairfax. Pay and Go, which is a temporary program, is designed, and now that it's targeted at commercial uh, users only. I think it's very effective at making sure that those high-tech and biotech companies that will keep Montgomery County a strong community stay in the county and we can hopefully can bring some new ones in. And it is responsible. How about that, Mark? Well, I mean, it's interesting that the, the first commercial project through the door of Pay and Go is a strip center called Goshen Oaks. It's not a high-tech center. Um, Where is that located? Up near, um, I guess, near the Germantown, north part of the county. But the, the thing that's interesting to me is that um, that Bill Husband from Park and Planning said, if you really want to do this, we can craft this so it attracts high-tech biotech stuff into the I-270 corridor. And the council refused to take Husband's suggestions. The pay and go could have been modified, though I'm sort of skeptical of the modifications, um, could have been modified toward that, toward that high-tech if that's what we had wanted. The, the biggest problem in Montgomery County was a high vacancy rate. Uh, we, it took a long time to vacancy bring our in. vacancy in office. Mm -hmm. um, it took a long time, it's taken a long time to bring our vacancy rate down. Um, that high vacancy rates depress office rentals, which is depressed the property tax base for commercial property. Um, bringing in more office, permitting more pay and go growth, doesn't necessarily solve anything. As, as Hussman again will tell you from the planning board, there's millions of square feet approved waiting to be built. 
it doesn't need pay and go to go forward. There's, there, were, there are plenty of projects that could go forward when the market is right. And I believe that when the market is right, it'll hit Montgomery County. And I think even members of the business community were writing back in the fall that they thought this would be Montgomery County's year because they were tracking the vacancy rate decline. And they said the rates are beginning to come down to a reasonable level. If it continues to fill, there'll be, a new, there'll be demand for new space in Montgomery County. Montgomery County will go forward again. But it's sort of like this, this competition with Fairfax County. And I'm not really interested in growing as fast as Fairfax County. Montgomery County has had an amazingly healthy economy. I mean, if, if we are in trouble, it's hard to, to reconcile that with the, uh, the tax cut that was just passed by the county council and, and the high level of revenues that are here. Um, I don't think the county is in trouble. And I think we had a sound, sound plan for growth management. And I think we need to stick to that sound plan and not get upset because one year we don't quite have the, uh, the growth of the construction that, that, that Fairfax County has. Um, ear to the ground. Uh, Derek Berlage, nice guy. Um, would like to have him in the family even, maybe. Um, but uh, not so sure that he's getting the job done. Questions about your effectiveness. Questions about your commitment uh, to being a council member first. How do you respond? Well, I think I'm extremely effective. And I can tell you I am extremely committed. And you can put your ear to the ground, or you can put your nose in the county budget, or in the county's legislative ordinance book. And what you'll see is the record of accomplishment, my accomplishments over eight years, which establish pretty clearly that I've been both effective and committed. I spoke about the 400 new classrooms for, for the Silver Spring, greater Silver Spring area, the eight new parks, one for each year I've been in office, all the money to revitalize downtown Silver Spring and expand Montgomery College. Now that's on the funding front. On the legislative front, I was the author of the Forest Conservation Act. I was the author of legislation that was recently passed by the council to establish stricter penalties for discrimination in housing and discrimination in employment. I was the sponsor of the gun county's gun control legislation, which regulates gun shops, makes sure that minors can no longer go into a gun store unless they're accompanied by their parent or guardian. It also establishes gun-free zones around schools and parks and recreation centers. Uh, I could list a number of other bills, a number of other funding uh, priorities that I've worked on that have been accomplished. What I ask my voters and our constituents to do is look at the record. And uh, that's what counts, is what have you actually been able to accomplish. And I think, with again, with the support of my community, I didn't do it by myself. I have a great constituency. They work very hard with me to make sure that we get these things for our community. But I've got a great record. What do you think? Um, I mean, I think the, the, the school issue is an interesting one. I mean, we do have 400 new classrooms, but the, the pattern for um, building those classrooms or renovating them was set by the school board. And that, the, that on battles like Blair, if you, in fact, if your ear is to the community, the feeling is that Derek was not the leader on Blair that the community wanted, that, um, that he was ready to compromise on Blair and the community wasn't ready to compromise on Blair. And, you know, people in Tacoma Park and Silver Spring can talk to the leaders of the Blair fight and see what they think about it. But, but more to the point, I mean, four to new classrooms is nice, but if you go to Highland View Elementary School, you find a fourth, fifth grade teacher there who's got 31 kids in the classroom. If you go to Eastern Middle School, you see portables all over the site in a building that needs bad renovation. If you go to the Wheaton Cluster, you'll find kids jammed into parkland in a building that needs renovations and that cannot possibly be expanded to serve the population that, that is gonna attend parkland now and in the future. And in this year, with adequate revenues, um, this council could not speed up the school modernization program, could not add another holding school, um, couldn't do the things. We're 15 years behind on school modernizations. There are schools, it'll be 2012 before we can get on a 30 year cycle in this county. There That's are too many kids. That's going to be the last word, I'm afraid. Okay. Uh, I want to thank both Derek Berlage and Mark Elrich for joining us in the coffee house. Good luck to both of you on September 15th. Thank you. I'm Mark Cohen, and this has been Coffee House Forum. Still to come, Tot Gymnastics in Silver Spring, folk rock music by Eric Brace, a Rose Solari poem, what Tacoma is reading and watching, and author William Loiseau. But first, get out the popcorn. Thank you, gentlemen. Step aside! Goes fast, isn't it? Commandos! Target that lizard! Go! Ah, so
summer. The sun, the pool, and the summer movie. It's a disposable virtual vacation for us, but not for the film studios. Summer is their prime time. And for certain kinds of movies, a Godzilla, a Small Soldiers, a Dr. Doolittle, a Mulan, summer is something much, much more. Summer is when they build new brands. You know, Superman, Batman, Star Wars. Think of it as homesteading new mental real estate inside each of our heads. Chancy doesn't always work. Look at Disney's Hercules. But worth the risk. Because once they've carved out that space in our minds, they can charge us rent on it for the rest of our lives. Animated TV shows, t-shirts, comics, video games, posters, CDs, whatever. And since most entertainment companies now have their own divisions for TV, books, video games, whatever, they all want their very own new brands. The best vehicle for launching a new cultural icon is, of course, the movies. So it's no surprise that Godzilla has behind it the largest licensing campaign in history. 200 licensees, 3,000 different items, including an alarm clock that roars you awake, the largest toy line in history, gym bags in Canada, address books in the Czech Republic, rubber boots in Austria. You see, size does matter. The size of the marketing campaign, anyway. Meanwhile, if you would just like to see a movie, rather than to be part of the latest experiment in psychic real estate, there are other summer choices. From Steven Spielberg's World War II epic, Saving Private Ryan, to the offbeat independent made by and about Native Americans, Smoke Signals. Or you could watch movies finally coming out on video, like this month, Wings of the Dove, or the Julie Christie movie, Afterglow. My own July favorite is an unlikely summer choice, the Cannes Film Festival success, Welcome to Sarajevo. It's an unflinching version of the memoirs of a British journalist who covered the war in Bosnia. Vegetables, Greg. Greg, get the vegetables, can you? In the bags. This guy with the eye. Greg? Greg? What's the guy's name? What's the, what's the driver's name? Risto. Risto? Risto! What's she saying? What's she saying? She doesn't know what she's saying. She has lost her control. Greg, get you the... You shouldn't film her. Get the bread. Chris, takes up the cause of children in an orphanage, and he tries to smuggle out one little girl. The movie was actually filmed in Sarajevo, and it mixes in real-life videotape. It's about war, about war correspondence, and about what happens when journalism falls on deaf ears, when the people of Bosnia are abandoned anyway. Welcome to Sarajevo, sometimes tough, not for the kids, but as a film and as a story, it takes us seriously. And after a summer at the movies, that can be a relief. Good luck and good viewing. Hi, and welcome to Body and Soul. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, we as a nation are younger than we've ever been. In effect, the so-called mini-population boom is now bigger than the original baby boom. So it's no surprise that we are getting our kids involved in athletic pursuits at an earlier and earlier age, even if we have to go out there and take them by the hand ourselves. Witness the local gymnastics program in which middle-aged moms and dads hit the mats with their wee little toddlers, barely two years old. It's one of the more popular programs at Silver Spring Stars in Silver Spring. Uh, also, one of the more stressful. Just ask Sherry Hope and Gail Marks, who helped run it. Hi and welcome. Thank Hi, you for how being you here. <laughs> <laughs> Sherry, let me ask you this. You're the director at uh, it's Silver Stars, am I right? Silver, Silver Stars. Yes. So this must have been your brainstorm, right? Having little wee little things out there. Well, actually, when I first started, I thought that they were too young. Um, 
at, at two and, and after taking several classes um, I was convinced that uh, there was definitely a need for it and there was definitely people interested in taking these classes. So, so, um, so people were pounding on your door to some yeah, extent. Um, so by popular have, demand, by I started popular. <laughs> started them. Um, so they would have three or four or five year olds involved 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 in your programs, and they'd say, "Can I have my younger?" Right. We started out um, with starting with three year olds and having the class um, done with just the child, and then um, over the years we had you know moms sitting with the younger toddlers in in the waiting room saying, "We need to do something with these kids." <laughs> So we started the Mom and Me class, and it has become what, probably one of the most popular classes we have. And, and Gail, you help get out there and... and yeah, I'm one of the instructors. You, you, do, uh, the, you do the actual... Teach, <laughs> I guess I teach almost all of the classes. Some of them have gone, gotten big enough that we have two or three instructors during the week. Most of them are weekday mornings early. All right. Now, you mentioned to our video photographer that this really you really rack up some stress points when you're out there sometimes. Sometimes, but a, a lot of times they, they really work out quite well once everybody gets an idea of what's happening. It is a structured class and some of the kids have been, either we have an open gym where they can just come and play with an adult supervising them or they've been to other programs that aren't quite as structured, but we have an actual warm-up. We go around to different stations, which are different equipment, different little obstacle courses we create where they can climb over, okay. under, learn forward rolls, and, and all kinds of different you, things. You know what we'll do here? Because as I said, we have a video photographer out there. Why don't we just uh, get the uh, tape rolling here? If it's ready to go, let's, uh, let's have a look, and we can see it in action. Uh, there it is. Um, this is so the stretch where Give us um, a little commentary. where the moms or the dads, we have dads that come, um, and nannies. nannies, they try to convince their children that, that they're going to participate in what we want them to do, which um, the first couple of weeks is, is kind of difficult because children have a mind of their own and see something that they'd rather be doing. Um, now she's good. She, she's yeah. a little she, bit older yeah. um, and she's actually been in some classes. now. Usually the classes, um, they start out, um, and th th this is the first structured thing that they've done. So getting children to wait their turn and to do the warm up and to follow directions is the big obstacle that we have to overcome. And after the second or third class or so, they've kind of got the idea of what we're doing and. Um, and how the, the program works. Training yeah. the parents also is, is, is a, a is difficult little, thing is too. It, now is like this on the trampoline <laughs> there, normally we just have one child at a time except for at the end where we all sit them in a circle. But the first day, and those were some very young ones, I had to kind of improvise to let a couple of jump a little bit for a few minutes before we broke it, them out. This is mainly the moms showing up here. I, any dads come? Sometimes. Sometimes dads? There are not very many dads uh, that come on a continual basis. How, how and I think that's because of the time of the day. On Saturdays right. we do have a few more dads that, that come and participate. But most of these are done early morning. Um, how, are how astute are the dads when they show up? Do they, it do they really? <laughs> it varies from parent uh, to parent. Yeah. Um, some some dads are right in there and and doing the things with the kids and the other times when they come they're like shocked that they even have to take their shoes off and <laughs> sit down on the ground. Um, dads, so it, are, dads are a pretty inhibited bunch, I'm, I'm <laughs> convinced. Um, what about the difference between boys and girls? I think we see mostly girls here, right? Is that... Um, you know? not, really. not really. I'd no. say at that age I think it's probably 50-50. Yeah, I'd say close to it. I, some classes will end up with more girls, but it's there are a lot of little boys yeah. and How, they, they vary too. Sometimes they run around more and probably may not do some of the skills quite as quickly as some of the girls, but, but you can't generalize either. And um, now are we, how easy, how easy is it to spot raw talent at this age? Uh, do you see future Olympians uh, here? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I would say that uh, 
at that age, I think it's too early. Um, you can see kids at that age that are more coordinated, um, but to pick a future Olympian from that age is, is pretty you got to be <laughs> have a pretty good insight on. And they are young. How how is the how old young is the youngest? The, we say 18, 19 months, probably. And there are some that do fine at that age. There are probably the bulk of the kids are two to two and a half. And in fact, in the bigger classes, we'll often have a just very young two group, and then we'll have the older, the two and a half to three. And they'll end up doing quite different things in the class. Um, I mean, the very young ones won't be able to do the kind of skills that we can get the two and a half year olds to do. Right. Well, you know, I mentioned Olympians, but someone suggested to me that it's actually the other end of the spectrum that really benefits the most, those kids who are sort of shy and timid and who have difficulty out in the playground and here sort of learn playground skills mm -hmm. and have to strut a little bit. That's, that's some of the most fun things to see happen when, like we have monkey bars which are low and I'll help them. I mean, I hold them, I kind of help guide their hands the first few times and then they'll get the idea. But someone who would, you know, never ever look at a monkey bar and think they could do it on the playground here has a controlled atmosphere to learn how and to actually soft approach and, it. Yeah, yeah. I think also that uh, um, the kids get, get such self confidence when they can, you know, when they can finally do that forward <laughs> roll. And I mean, they get up and and they think they've just, you know, got a ten at the Olympics, and so right. do their parents. You know, so um, it's really. V very rewarding to see kids who could barely um, hop. I mean, the basic things that that you think and you think that children should all do these things, but these are learned skills and hopping on one foot and hopping on two feet and um, doing those basic it's, motor skills. I mean, fun. the confidence that it, it builds. It brings a very shy child out to being, you know, look at me. Well, bottom line, would you say this is mostly yuppie indulgence, or would you say there's some there's some real benefit here? Oh, I think there's a tremendous yeah. amount of benefit, um, especially to um, their self confidence to to be able to move their bodies um, and do the task that they're you know they they do a lot of repetitious stuff, but they get s good at it. And I mean, a kid that was afraid to put their head down and roll over right. is by the end of the class is doing it and getting up and going to da so if you were a mom with a two-year-old you would do this you don't have a two-year-old no, no mine's but, 12. <laughs> yours is 12, but you would do this well all right um we're going to post your uh, phone number up on the screen here uh, i hope and uh, you can t <laughs> tell the our vast audience uh, when you're when when to call and when the next classes are and so forth well, the next classes uh, start in the fall, um, September 5th. Um, they can call and um, request one of our schedules. And we run nine week or 12 week sessions, and they fill the it yeah. very fast. So. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, generally, the, the little stars, which is what we call right. that class, run 9 30, 10 15, 11 o'clock right. in well, the morning. Well, call this number that should be on the screen here and. Uh, and you'll get all the rest of the poop. And thank you for being here. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Until next time, I'm Howard Cohn. And this has been Body and Soul. Eric Grace, author William Wazow, what Tacoma is reading and watching, but first. I'm Rose Solari. And I'm going to read a section of a longer poem um, about the myth of Aphrodite and Adonis, though I think it's a section that translates for any kind of love. This is called What She Tells Herself. In her lucid moments, fewer and fewer now, she makes the promise all breaking and broken-hearted lovers make to themselves. I'll give it just one more month, one week, one hour. This is the last time. And is proud of herself for making it through an afternoon without him. This is the last time, she says, in yet another letter that I will write you, sealing and sending it or not, then tying her hair and skirt in the manner he likes best.
and repeats to herself the last time as she follows him into the woods, lies down beside him, strokes his face in sleep, and trembles all over again as if for the first time at the translucence of the body that houses his soul. How close to the surface floats his heartbeat, how warm the blood that runs so near beneath his skin, and which is more beautiful, and how the two compete and praise this is, this must be the last time, pulling him into her arms to wake him, weak on purpose, believing the ground must surely shake itself into flower beneath their bodies, so rich is the juice that pours from him, so sweet his touch, however cruel his words, and so rapturous her assault that goes on and on as if and always for the last time. So far away across the room, I wish that I could tell you what's been running through my head. Wish I could cross the floor and hand you a ticket to fly away with me, to fly away with me. Oh, oh, oh my angel, Angelina. With your alabaster fingers, I hope you'll understand. Oh, my angel Angelina, kiss me now. Put your cool lips on my brow. Would you fly across the sky with me and sit by my side? Would you lean across the armrest and whisper all your secrets? Every time I catch your eye, I wonder what's behind it. I don't know where happiness hides, but I'm game to try to find it. Oh, oh, oh my angel Angelina, hold my hand With your alabaster fingers, I hope you'll understand Oh, my angel Angelina, kiss me now Put your cool lips on my brow Every time I catch your eye Wonder what's behind it I don't know where happiness hides But I'm game to try to find it Oh, oh, oh my angel Angelina Hold my hand With your alabaster fingers I know, I know you'll understand Oh, my angel Angelina Kiss me now Put your cool lips on my brow Your cool lips on my brow Oh, Angelina, kiss me now Well, I'd like to welcome you, Eric Brace, to you, the musical traditions segment of the show. It's a pleasure to be here. You know, it's hard when, you, when I listen to the song and I'm sitting there getting this image of Angelina and I'm wondering, who is this person? Is there a real <laughs> Angelina? I'm thinking, and then I've got to jump up and come out and interview you. I know. I'm glad I've got you so raptured a, over you there. You got me there. It was a statue, actually, you know. Uh -huh. but Hence the alabaster fantasy fingers. Fantasy life, you know. Yeah, all right. Well, vivid. <laughs> it's great. Um, I was thinking... I guess I met you many years ago because we spoke at the time of, of trading baseball cards oh, yeah. for finely handcrafted instruments. <laughs> That's and what it was. We I, never... <laughs> I had old doubles of stuff I collected when I was eight, nine, ten, and yeah. you know, you trade your interests after a while, but yeah. I've still got them somewhere. And of course, my mom has one of the standard stories about throwing out the yeah. Sandy Koufax rookie right, card. The rookies. Right. <laughs> but meanwhile, back to the music. Oh, yeah. um, when did you start? Um, playing guitar and actually and composing your own songs 
it wasn't until high school, which is around here. I went to Wilson in D.C., and uh, a friend of mine had a guitar lying around. I just started playing it and, you know, listening back then in the 70s to all those people all that you listen to. You when know. you say a guitar lying around, was it an electric or an acoustic? No, acoustic. I still have a hard time. I play in a full yeah. band uh, on the side that is called Last Train Home, and, and even in that band I play an acoustic guitar, and uh, I just can't, can't get it. So right. I just started strumming all the usual folky stuff, and... Uh, Finally, it occurred to me, hey, I can do this. So now, I when tried. you did that in high school, mm -hmm. we're, we're talking about 1975. Oh, you're cruel. Yeah, come on. I know. <laughs> 75 to 70. I was class of 77. Okay. And was there, a, was there a folk movement then, or were you doing this basically uh, in the bedroom with the door closed? No, there were a lot of people. It was sort of those, uh, the remains, it was just at the tail end of the land of hippies and just before the punks, right. uh, especially at Wilson. You know, those I think, formative years. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And uh, nobody had much else to do but sit around and play guitar. And yeah. it was pre-coffee years, too. I think there was a lot yeah. of underage beer drinking, probably. But we Just won't talk little. about that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, do you have a, yet another uh, original for us? Sure. I'll what, play what another What was the song. name of the last? The that one was called Angelina. Okay. And that's on the, the record with a full band on it. That's on the Last Train Home record that okay. just came out. But and this is uh, Hamaha. Hama, hama. Well, you know how it is. <laughs> you know. That's why I get paid the big bucks. It's uh, <laughs> that command. Language. What uh, what's this one called? It's uh, another one word. It's called Louisiana, and it's probably another heartbreak song. And it'll probably it's not about a statue though. This is about a real person. But it's uh, uh -huh. it's right. more of a country shuffle song. So imagine a big rhythm section. Behind. I got it. Called Louisiana. Did I say what it was called? Yeah, you did. Okay. All right. Thank you. When you say it like that. Shreveport sounds so far away Explain to me again And make it make some sense Why you're going back You said something about Your family and your friends But tonight I just can't pretend That I wish you well In Louisiana the only thing I wish is that you would stay. Oh, whoa, oh, 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 Louisiana, you stole my heart away. Once there was a time I loved Louisiana for sending me a woman. The most beautiful woman that I'd ever seen Now you're going back home And you're going alone So tonight my opinions revise About that place Louisiana Oh, I'm in an awful state today Whoa, oh, oh Louisiana, you stole my heart away. We went together once down to Louisiana, and you told me all your secrets walking through the bottom land. Now you say when you're settled in, and when we become just friends, that you like. In your new home, Louisiana Well, as if I could just walk in one day No, I'll never go back to Louisiana You stole my heart away You stole my heart away Name the person that one's about, but we know <laughs> geographically knows. she knows. Yeah.
and your good friends today. Uh -huh. That's good. Um, I noticed uh, when I was looking at your guitar in the green room, as we say, <laughs> uh, I noticed there's a signature on there. There is uh, just recently. I got oh, it's that one recent. Done. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it wasn't in the olden days of the band. It's Levon Helm. I don't know yeah. if uh, are we getting a close up on that. Hey, you got it. You got Levon it Helm. Perfectly I know. I'm flat. trying to get yeah. the shine looking in the monitor. Right. There you go. Um, he played down at Jack's in Springfield, and uh, okay. my band had the good fortune to open up for him. And I say good fortune because who else is there but. Well, there's the band, yeah, and there's, there's, there's the Beatles, a, yeah. and all those bands that start with B, like Beach right. Boys and things. But yeah, he was a big hero, and so I figured he can sign it, even though he's not a guitarist. Now, in the period from moving from the bedroom in high school, let's mm -hmm. say, up until the present, was there a time you didn't play in a band, didn't play out? Did you sort of lay back for a while? Uh, or has there always been kind a, of, a band? It was, it was sort of a, a, a random thing that happened. I, was, I played in a bluegrass band all through college, and then, uh, then after college, and punk and new wave hit i was like oh gotta do this so i played electric bass in a band with my brother and we played sort of new wave stuff all through the mid 80s and yeah. late 80s and then i sort of started getting back to the roots and and i was always playing out i think it's, yeah. it was just it's just sort of in me i sort of, i have to i'm a ham basically yeah i love it it's a good thing <laughs> um makes for an easy interview for me anyway um, <laughs> am i talking too much <laughs> no no that's perfect you know <laughs> they don't want to see me um you got one more to take us out with? Sure. Um, this is a song by a friend of mine named Carl Straub. He's in a band called The Grave Robbers. And uh, he's got a song uh, on our record that uh, I'm not going to do, but this is another song of his that I hope to put on a uh, second record. It's Good. called It Doesn't Matter. Okay, take us home. I think the night is for the dreamers But don't get one in your bed Cause she'll treat you like you're just some pretty love song That's been running, running, running through her head It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter It doesn't matter what I've done it doesn't matter, no, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter what I've done. And you know that I'm a man of solid virtue, and I won't disgrace your name. And you know that I would never try to hurt you, but I've hurt you just the same it doesn't matter no it doesn't matter it doesn't matter what I've done it doesn't matter no it doesn't matter it doesn't matter what I've done that I would learn to keep a promise but promises they grow like weeds and I watch them grow so high they're gonna choke me and that's the last thing that I need it doesn't matter it doesn't matter it doesn't matter 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 what I've done it doesn't matter, no, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter, matter what I Just ahead, author William Wiseau on Writer's Block.
As a college student years ago, I learned there were two kinds of writing, fiction and nonfiction. And one of my professors stressed the difference between the two. Nonfiction or journalism is about the facts. Fiction, on the other hand, is about the truth. But this line blurs when we encounter the memoir because the writing is both fictionalized and based on facts. It is the author's version of events based on facts yet fictionalized, a made-up piece of dialogue, a possible scenario, an imaginary course of events, so that the memoir today reads much like the novel, incorporating the research of journalism with fictional technique. My guest tonight is William Lawasso, author of The Shooting of Rabbit Wells, An American Tragedy. His book is part memoir, part historical document, about the senseless death of a young man. William Lawasso is also the author of Anna, A Daughter's Life, and he currently lives in Hyattsville, Maryland, and he's a former resident of Tacoma Park. Thank you for appearing at the coffee house. Oh, it's nice to be here. Uh, tell us who Rabbit Wells was and why you decided to do this book. Yeah, I decided to, to do it because his life and his death have, um, have, have bothered me for, for 25 years now, and I, I uh, finally got around to saying, Bill, write, write this book. He was um, a, a mixed-race young man um, from Trenton, New Jersey. He never knew his dad. His, um, his mother was mildly retarded. Mm -hmm. And he grew up in foster homes. And um, at the age of 14, he came to my um, affluent community of Basking Ridge, New Jersey, mm -hmm. um, and lived in a place called the Bonnie Bray Farm for Boys. Mm -hmm. He did well in the school there. And he then moved from that school into the public schools, which were almost exclusively white. Mm -hmm. And uh, he did well in the schools there. Uh, he wasn't a saint, but, mm -hmm. but he, he did okay. And uh, you and knew him. Yeah, yeah, and that's where I ran into him. Uh -huh. And I was not a particularly close friend of his, but we were acquaintances. We knew one another. Mm -hmm. And um, a few years after we graduated, he was shot and killed um, by a policeman outside a bar in, in, in the middle of town. Uh, and that story, his life and, and his death, have always just bugged me. Mm -hmm. um, why did it happen? How could it have happened in this in this community that that um, brings children up and gets them off to college and 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 takes wonderful care of them in general? How could that happen in in, in my community mm -hmm. and and uh, the disjunction of of the the sort of foster fostering of youth that that is is the way that we supposedly live there and what actually happened to Rabbit from that disjunction mm -hmm. I. I I, I felt the need to write to write this book, and you do it in the in the. I talk about the memoir earlier in mm -hmm. the sense that it's about this young man that right. you knew, and it's mostly about him. Right. But it's also about you yeah. and about other people that you both knew and right. people that you came to know later after his death. Mm -hmm. You interviewed. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's it's written through my the first person through the lens of my own consciousness. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's what a memoir allows you allows you to do. It's 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 a good um, way to write about something I, that's that's happened 25 years ago. Um, it, it it allows you to in your present consciousness as the writer as the mature person right. that I right. uh, suppose I am um, to look back and 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 you can you can compare what it is that you thought back then. What did you think was going on back then? Mm -hmm. What did you even were you even aware of Rabbit's life in any mm -hmm. significant way, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to how I live, how how I think about it about it now? Mm -hmm. Well, that's what's so interesting to me about it. Actually, is that you're writing this book now versus how you would have written it ten years ago, or yeah. uh, you know, fifteen years sure. ahead. It, it, well, I so certainly couldn't have written um, the same book mm -hmm. um, ten years ago, or or certainly when when I knew Rabbit back in nineteen the late 60s and early 70s because mm -hmm. um, I've, I've lived longer and uh, I, I think I've, I hope I've become a more <laughs> sophisticated person uh -huh. <laughs> so. but anyway that's that's what a memoir allows you allows mm -hmm. you to do and and in incorporating my own life I was able to uh, but in using the first person also compare my life to to rabbit's life which is very mine was a more or less normal life mm -hmm. in the sort of suburban um, upper middle class suburb uh, community where I lived, uh -huh. 
uh, and 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 use that as a kind of comparison point to to uh, from which I could explore Rabbit's life. You also explore race. Um, mm -hmm. Quite a bit, actually. Mm -hmm. you, you have uh, in the early part of the book. You're talking about how your family didn't really particularly think about it until there was this sort of riot. Um, yeah, yeah. And yeah. suddenly, all the black Nineteen. faces. You realize there, you sure. know, there, there was the cleaning lady. There was the janitor. Yeah. There was the. And how yeah. did they feel in this sort of bucolic setting? That, you know, that yeah. uh, that suddenly there was the 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 undercurrent. Of, sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, and and you bring that up into yeah. Rabbit's story. Yeah, we lived, we lived um, as, as many upper middle class white people lived um, mm -hmm. in, in, in certain suburbs where you certainly make, you, you make certain assumptions about people of color and they're, they're, they're there in your community. They don't live there, but they come into the community to mm -hmm. render certain kinds of services. Mm -hmm. And then they, then they fly, then they go, go off. Right. Uh, in 1967, there, was, there were, there were uh, riots in, in Plainfield and suddenly we began, at least some, some of us began to think, you know, uh, we began to think, uh, uh, where did these people come from? <laughs> you mm -hmm. know? Right. I was a 10 year old kid at the time, but you, something comes into consciousness mm -hmm. that should have been there some time ago, but it eventually comes. And it was at that time, about that time, that Rabbit came into our lives. Uh -huh. Um, in, in, in those tumultuous days of the late, late 60s. Mm -hmm. um, and, and part of the sort of uh, interracial discord of the times um, was uh, colored, I think, the, uh, was, was part of the reason, of, of a whole complex of reasons behind Rabbit's, behind the Rabbit's death. The policemen were aware that there was a lot, uh, you know, the, the, the Panthers had, had recently um, killed some people in New York. Mm -hmm. There were police, uh, there were shootings of policemen in, in, in New York, racially, mm -hmm. racial, yes. racially connected sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And so all of this kind of uh, is, is part of the background of, of, of his very particular human story. And, but what you do with the policeman who shot mm -hmm. Rabbit, who mm -hmm. basically shot him in a totally senseless, you know, awful yeah. way, um, yeah. is you paint this very compassionate picture of him. He's mm -hmm. not just some racist white policeman who's got it yeah. in for you know black kids who show up in bars. I mean, it's yeah. it's you do a very um, realistic and empathetic uh, picture. Yeah, I, I would have been less interested, I think, in writing this story if um, if the policeman was a sort of pure villain, mm -hmm. if he was yeah. was just some sort of crazy person who was out there to kill mixed race people or African Americans. Right. You do the same thing with yeah. Rabbit Wells as well. I mean in the sense that you you have the scene where the girlfriend talks about him being his hitting her. Yeah. I yeah. mean you, Yeah, he wasn't a perfect you're, person. You're not at all. You yeah, show I mean he was the, he was angry at times mm -hmm. and his anger spilled out into into some some acts that that he that he regretted. Right. Um, and he, both of these what I try to do in this book is is to pay attention to the complexity of all of these characters. Mm -hmm. The policeman is not simply a villain. A mm -hmm. villain. He committed a terrible act. Yes. But he committed one as a person who's not all that distant. Mm -hmm. He's not over the edge. Right. He's, he's, At all. He's a he's, human he's, he's being. Many, yeah. he's, he's, he's very much like me mm -hmm. in many ways. Mm -hmm. um, and, and yet he did this. That's yeah. why I was interested in this. And Rabbit, by the same token, was no no sort no of no angel, no saint. No, yeah. no. Painting, yeah. painting all of him was was of paramount importance. Well, that's what's interesting to me about the book too, is in, in the sense that you have the fictional stuff, and that you had to invent some dialogue, some mm -hmm. scenes, and yet you've got mm -hmm. the hard reporting. Right. I mean, right. in the sense that you interviewed all these people, and yeah, yeah, you did your research. Yeah, the research was was the was the really interesting part because mm -hmm. I would go up and talk to all of Rabbit's old old friends, mm -hmm. I w and many of them have artifacts that he made. He was a very artistic, poetic kid, and so I would gather these artifacts. Mm -hmm. um, I would I would go to the places where he where he lived and walked mm -hmm. and and get his school records and get his records from uh, as when he was in foster care. So I amassed all this in this information. But there were still places that my job, what I thought in, in this book, was to understand him and to try to understand him from the inside. Yeah. And in order to do that, I had to make kinds of imaginative leaps. Mm -hmm. I had to um, say, okay, from all this material that I've gathered, 
what did he feel like when he was lying in bed, for instance? Mm -hmm. <laughs> sure. What was he feeling when he wrote a poem? Mm -hmm. And then even more, what was he feeling when he was shot right. and killed? Yeah. Now, there's no way that I can know that. Yeah. He's dead. I can't ask him these questions. Mm -hmm. But I can gather as much about him as I can. And then, despite my own that I'm not an African American. Right. It's clear. I not I didn't come from his his background. I didn't know him as as intimately as I might. But still, given that, I try to imagine my way into into what it was, what yes. it must have felt like, what he was thinking, mm -hmm. and and that's sort of what's that's what's propels the book. Yes, and you set it up. We're about out of time, but you set it up in the sense that his death is. The whole book is directed towards right. this, even yeah. as you, we've got his birth, we've got his, you right. know, the, the, the background of the policeman, we've got the background of uh, right. several people involved with him. And, um, and yet we know from the get-go that mm -hmm. he was shot down yeah. you know, in this awful way. Yeah. And the, that information drives the narrative yeah. Um, yeah. in a fictional sort of right. way. Um, yeah, the question is not what happens, but how it happens. How it happens, yes. In, in, in this book. And you fill it in. I mean, yeah, it, it and you all try to see the, all the strands that, that come together at yeah. this terrifically tragic moment. Yes. And, and, and that's mostly a matter of rendering the complexity of that moment, that it's not just a, just didn't happen because of one reason, but it happened because of a whole all of complex complex web of events that, that, that came, came together. Yes, that's right. So, um, well, I, I very much enjoyed it and oh, appreciate your, your coming on the program tonight. Um, well, thanks for having me on. Thanks again to author William Loazzo for joining us in the Coffee House. I'm Lisa Page and this has been Writer's Block. That's it for this edition. See you next time in the Coffee House. <laughs>